Cool. Uh, welcome back to uh, PyCon. The uh, next speaker is Lex Hyder. Um, an ex-presenter claims to know a lot about computer. I'm not sure if that's a typo or not. Uh, you can tell because he has a beard, which indeed he does. That isn't a typo. He's a professional Python hacker since 2010. He's currently working with some interesting tech as part of the data science team at his day job with JBA. Please make, make Lex Hyder welcome. Hello, hello. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name's Lex Hyder. Um, I'm giving a talk about salt. Um, who here uh, knows what salt is? Who's played with salt? Uh, who's actually deploying with salt? Okay, so not, not many, but most of you know what it is. So. If you haven't heard of it, it's kind of like Chef and Puppet, but written in Python. Um, so uh, I'm on Twitter on the Lectural Chocolate uh, or Lectural on GitHub, uh, and the talk's called How to Be Truly Lazy, uh, or the alternate title is Can't Someone Else Do It? Or the other alternate title is Assault with a Deadly Pepper. Um, if you have any questions, if you could leave them to the end, because I've got a fair bit of stuff to get through. Um, uh, so, I thought I'd start by talking about the uh, elephant in the room. Um, so, I went to PyCon last year, had a great time, and I thought I would love to come again and actually give a talk this time. So, I submitted a talk and it was uh, accepted, which was great. Uh, and then I heard that there's a Django Con going to be on, and I, that's great. And then I heard that uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss was going to come, one of the creators of Django, uh, a role model of mine, so I was really excited. Uh, and then the conference schedule came out and my talk was up against Jen uh, Jacob's, which was uh, not great. Uh, led to some anxiety. So I was really worried I was going to be talking to an empty theatre, so thanks very much for rocking up. Uh, it's a bit of a miracle. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, so... Um, Given the Django example, I'm going to give an example of deploying, um, saltifying the Django project uh, website and how you would configuration manage that with salt. I'm going to give an overview of salt, um, how to do remote execution uh, with salt. That's salt's hello world. That will communicate to all your servers and check that they're communicating OK. Um, if I get time, I'm going to talk about salt cloud. This will spin up um, servers in the cloud and provision them for you. Um, and we do dev builds with Vagrant, which um, will provision our virtual machines for your dev builds. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I've been a Python hacker for a while. My day job's mainly kind of working with data, so a lot of SQL, um, work with NumPy and Pandas and stuff like that. Um, so a few apologies. I'm not actually a DevOps guy or a CC admin guy. I imagine there's a lot of people who, though, fall into the same boat as uh, looking after servers without it being their uh, main thing. Um, I have terrible PowerPoint skills and I've never actually used Chef or Puppet, so I've probably got the answers on how they compare to Salt. Um, uh, so the patron saint of laziness is Homer J. Simpson, um, and Salt just really helps you uh, automate a lot of things for you so you don't have to worry about them, and uh, I think that's been pretty great. Um, so. Let's go. The architecture of Salt. Um, we have uh, a single Salt master uh, server, and a master server controls its minions, and it does so. Um, it can scale up to thousands of mi minions, and it can tell them to run commands, and it can tell them to deploy themselves and what they should look like, and it can query them for information about them. Um, this really saves you a lot of time so that you can, you know, get busy doing things that you uh, want to be doing. 
So, um, configuration management. Um, who's using any kind of configuration management? It doesn't have to be salt. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so, probably the best thing about configuration management is that it's repeatable and that you actually spend your time basically just coding in a, in a text editor, writing code about what your service should look like. Uh, so, what can salt do? It can do remote execution as well, so you can tell uh, your servers that you want to run commands and it'll run them and uh, give you the results back. Um, and it does this in parallel, so it doesn't, um, you know, each server doesn't wait its turn and, and run it. They all do it at the same time, send it back to you. Um, and we're not using SSH, so I'll go into that a bit later. Um, so one thing you do with Salt is you can target which servers you want it to deploy or uh, run on. Um, so there's a couple of kind of Salt puns, vocab things you need to know. So one is uh, Salt grains. Um, when a uh, Salt um, minion boots up, a lot of static information that it knows about at startup is put into a data structure called grains, and then you can use that to query information about the servers and also to target which um, servers you want to run particular commands. Um, you, it's also available for when you're doing configuration management. Uh, okay, so bear with me, I'm going to try a demo. Hopefully the Wi-Fi allows me to connect to my server on EC2. Uh, so here we're logging into my uh, master server, and I've spun up um, a couple of minions that it's controlling. So that's how quickly that they are, you know, are communicating. Now that's not doing a network ping. That's just kind of making sure that they're passing messages between each other. So that's kind of the hello world. Uh, so the structure is you got your salt command. The the glob is um, the, the star is telling it to run on all servers. Uh, and that's a test.ping. Um, so, one useful thing I find with this is patching my servers. So, this is going to do... So, it's OS agnostic, so this package tool will run on Debian the same as it will on Red Hat and, and different systems. So, this is basically doing an app get update. I'm running Ubuntu, and it's going to tell me which um, packages are out of date. It uh, should come back pretty shortly. Um, so demo four is all patched. Demo one needs to install some packages. Uh, the other one's thinking about it. I think the Wi-Fi is a bit patchy. So anyway, pretend that that worked. So then if I wanted to actually do an upgrade, I just run this command. Um, I can shell out. So that's running basically a shell command on all those servers. Again, you see you get a response really quickly. Um, Demo 4 has got an older version of Python. Uh, you can run arbitrary code. Uh, that's doing the same thing, but it's in, in Python. So. Uh, we're running the exec code module, calling Python. Uh, we're doing an import there. That's working. So again, you can just do arbitrary Python code. Uh, so that's a list comprehension running on all those servers. Um, so you can do regex to target your servers. So I could do something like that. That's going to work. Um, so the grains I was telling you about, so this is all the stuff that's in these grains, things that I can use to target and, and query. So it knows the architecture, CPU, it knows the host name, the network devices, um, the number of CPUs, the um, operating system, there's heaps of stuff in there. Uh, so one thing I used uh, Salt for recently is that an older version of Ubuntu was uh, end of life, so I wanted to know which ones needed to be upgraded. Single command, and second later, I know that demo four needs to do an upgrade, and so in theory I could do something like 
whatever the actual command is, something like that. Um, or just spin up a new one, actually, is probably what I would do. Um, the other thing we can do is we can target based on this grain information. So, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, so we're targeting just based on this, this grain information. Um, Uh, this is going to install package on all these um, servers. So you can see that demo2 got SL installed. Which, if you don't know SL, is one of my favorite command line commands. OK, so that's kind of remote execution. You can see it's pretty, pretty simple. There's a load of those modules built into the system. Um, so under the hood, you know, what's going on with uh, salt? Uh, it's written in Python. Um, it's open source. It's Apache licensed. Um, and it's got a really active community. Um, last year, on uh, it's a GitHub project. Uh, was actually in the top 10, uh, number eight of the most uh, unique contributors to any projects. Uh, and it's really, um, yeah, a great community. So on occasions when I've found a bug, um, and I report a bug, more often than not, it's already been fixed in master, or um, you know, it's fixed in a couple of days, if not hours. Uh, Salt's really lightweight, so it scales to you know, thousands of servers from a, from a single minion. Uh, sorry, from a single master server. Uh, and so it's communicating using 0MQ. So we have a, a master daemon running on the master. Each minion has its own minion daemon. Um, uh, there's a pub-sub communications going between the master and the minion that's running on port 405 uh, on the master. So they're the two ports you need to open on your master. You don't need to open any ports on your minion. And then 4506 is getting used to communicate back to the master. Um, this is how it's communicating its messages. It's using message pack. If you don't know message pack, it's a, like JSON, but fast and small. And it's a binary serialization format. Uh, and everything on the wire is encrypted. So uh, initially, uh, when a, mi a minion starts up, it uh, sends its public keys to the master. Um, and then on the master, you say, OK, I, I accept that's who you are. Uh, um, and so once they've been authenticated, um, we're using AES encryption for the payload communications, which uh, is a lot less expensive. Uh, so yeah, the thing with Salt is uh, philosophy is really based on simplicity. So you, you'll see once we get some states going, and you probably can tell already, it's, Simplicity is kind of the driving kind of idea behind a lot of the design decisions behind Salt. Uh, this is kind of a bit of a motto of mine. If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. It's kind of a lot of a big reason probably a lot of people in this room are using Python because it's it's easy, um, and everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, so, how do you install Salt? It's a one-line command. So there's, there's actually packages for all the different distros, Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Fedora, Arch. Salt Bootstrap is a project that's a uh, shell command that figures out what system you are, are on and then install um, your package from the appropriate uh, package management. So the first one-liner is to install a minion. The second one-liner is to install a master, and you just give me the M flag, basically. So that's, that's how easy it is to get installed. To configure it, there's almost no configuration needed. On the master, you shouldn't really need to configure the master at all. Uh, on each minion, the only thing you really need to configure to get started is to tell it where the master is. So you, know, you, you just give it an IP address or a domain name, um, and then you're good to go. Um, so the, you could see those examples for four, um, 
in the shell. Uh, so test.ping. All those things are just Python functions. It's not that hard. That's literally the source code for test.ping. Return true. Um, so yeah, configuration management. So um, when I started at my current job, before we started using configuration management, if you wanted to create a dev build or uh, deploy a server, you had to look up a Google Doc that had some out-of-date steps on what to do uh, to install uh, a new build, and would quite often be you know, out-of-date and broken, and it would take a long time to uh, deploy any servers, uh, which was less than ideal. Uh, but since we've started using salt, we have a single command to deploy a dev or a production build from uh, a single state tree. Uh, we have dev and production builds that are almost identical. We have a single command to spin up new cloud servers as a new minion, so that's the uh, salt cloud thing I hope to get to at the end. And then we have a single command to spin up new virtual machines as a new dev build, um, which is using Vagrant. Uh, so configuration management in salt, they're called salt states. They're really simple. Um, by default, you write them in YAML, uh, and you can template them with Jinja. Um, if you don't know YAML or Jinja, it's really, really simple. That's a YAML list. That's a YAML dictionary. Jinja's basically the same as Django templating. That's an if loop and a for loop, and getting a variable out. It's really simple. Uh, now, you don't have to use YAML. You don't have to use Jinja. Um, you can use Python code if you like. You can use Mako or Wempy. You can use JSON. They've got their own domain-specific language. Um, and you can write your own renderer. That's what these things are called. Uh, and it's really simple because states are just actually a data structure. And so this is kind of a, another sort of design decision with Salt is that it's really easy to write your own things in Python. So if you don't like the renderers that are there, you can write your own. The default is YAML and Jinja. The exec execution modules you saw, they're just Python functions. Um, so a returner. So when we um, tell uh, a minion to run a command, um, by default, what it does is it sends back to the master what the result was. That's just the default, though. You can tell it to send the result wherever you like. So you can send it to a database. Uh, you can send it as an email. You can do whatever action you like. Again, that's just a Python function. Um, state modules we're going to get to. Um, and so examples of all these, you can just look at the salt stack um, source tree. It's really easy to follow. Um, so this is what you know on disk your salt states will look like. So this two parts to it. You have a top file, and that's just basically targeting um, your various minions on um, you know, who's going to do what. And then you write these state files, which by default I said uh, are YAML. And there's two ways of doing it. You can either call it you know, foo.sls, or you can put it in a directory and call it init.sls. Um, so this is what a top file looks like. Um, so it's in the base environment. You can basically ignore that because um, everything's going to be in the base environment. Um, so, and then we're targeting just like before. So every server, we're going to install the common state, which might be things we want on every server. So it might be Vim and Tmux and NTP. Uh, on the demo uh, servers, we're going to run the SL state. And then we can also target using grain. So um, here we've got a, a, a role that's Django website. Uh, we're matching it by grain, and we're going to run the Django um, uh, state. Um, so this is what a state file looks like. It's really simple. So the first line, common package, that's just the name of it. It's going to call the package.installed um, state module. And then the rest of it is just the arguments that it's going to get passed. So we're going to make sure that Vim and Tmux is installed on all our servers. Uh, and then the bottom one is making sure that um, SL is installed on all our servers. Um, so once you've written your top file, once you've written your state files, the way that you actually get it to deploy is you run the state high state um, command. Uh, and so what this does is looks at the top file, figures out uh, who the relevant minions are, 
uh, and then applies the various states that you need. Um, I saw a talk recently on Ansible and the idea of item potency is kind of an interesting one. So the idea with these states is you're not saying, okay, do these things, do the, perform these actions. You're saying this is the state that you should be in, this is what you should look like. You should have this Git repo checked out and at the latest commit you should have these packages installed. So you should be able to run state, high state, and then run state, high state immediately after and it should do nothing the second time and, and take seconds. Uh, so this is an example from when we started using it. So we use a, a NoSQL database called React, uh, and so you run that in clusters of a minimum size of five. We've probably got a dozen in our um, cluster at the moment. And so when we were doing this by hand, it was really tedious uh, because each server is basically identical. The only really change on each server is that in one of the configuration files, you needed to put in um, the IP address of that particular um, node. Uh, so this is what the state file looks like to manage this. So um, Salt also has a file server um, to you know, send files over the wire from the master to the minion. So the source line there is saying um, get slash server slash salt slash react app dot config is the file that we're going to send across. 644 permissions. We're going to template it with Ginger. Uh, I'm going to get to the require one, but it's, that's basically saying make sure that this other state is finished, it's done its thing before we start this one, and then we're going to pass in as context to the template uh, the internal IP, and then what we're actually doing here is on, the, on each minion, it's going to run that salt command, um, which returns a list, so we're going to, uh, that's how we're going to get the IP address uh, for each server. And so then your templated configuration file just looks like this, and we've got a single source file for all of our servers. Um, so we've covered grains. The other thing uh, to know about is pillars, pillar of salt. Um, this is basically a global value for your minions. Um, so it's used for a couple of things. One is for sensitive data. So um, because you target it, just like you target um, salt states, you can make sure that only particular minions know about your you know, passwords and things that you might set in a pillar. And it also just helps you know, being a global value so you can you know, not repeat yourself everywhere. So one thing that we do is we use a custom grain called isDev that's set to true or false, depending if it's a dev build or not. And then we set um, the user variable to vagrant if it's a dev build and a boot to if it's not. And then um, this is making sure that the user is present, so that's creating a user called um, whatever the name is, making sure they've got their home directory, and then um, a Vim RC configuration file. Uh, one really neat thing that we do with our uh, RabbitMQ setup is that we set uh, our password in the pillar, and then that is used when we create the user, and then it's also used when we stick that value in our Django settings.py. So we actually just put the password in one place, um, and it's used everywhere. It's great. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to show you some real state, salt states look, look like. Uh, Um, so this is from the Django project website. This is their GitHub repo, and this is their README, which is basically saying to deploy Django's website, follow these steps. So it's kind of like the Google Doc example I had at the start. Um, so um, create a virtual env, install these dependencies. Now, by the way, you actually need some Debian packages to be able to pip install those things, which you know is not document documented. Um, create these databases, create these database uses, do some manage PI commands, run server. So, you know, it's pretty good, but um, it would be great if you could just kind of have a single command do all that for you. Uh, so I've kind of written some example um, salt states for just doing that. So, um, 
Now, I'm targeting everything here just because I have kind of wrote this quickly, but we're just saying, okay, all these states apply to this, this server, um, run it with Nginx, create a virtual amp, get a Git repo, PostSQL, uh, Postgres, sorry. Um, you can see all that. So the first thing you need to do is get um, your code from GitHub. Uh, you guys can see that okay? Um, so make sure that Git is installed. Um, this is going to create a SSH known host for GitHub so that you don't need to worry about that. We're going to make sure that the directory actually exists before we um, do a Git clone. Uh, and we're setting the actual directory in a pillar. Uh, and then there's a git latest salt module, so that's going to you know, pull from GitHub, it's going to get the master branch, put it in the directory that we set, and we're going to run it as that particular user that we've set in the pillar. And then before we run this state, we, though we're saying, okay, you need to have run the file state code, code root there, so make sure the directory exists, we've got the known host, and that git, git, um, git is installed. Uh, so, then we want to get our virtual inf set up. Um, so, you can refer to other states by doing an include, as I've done on the top line here. Uh, I'm installing virtual inf rather just from the uh, Debian packages. Um, before I run pip install, I actually need these Debian packages installed, which is not documented anywhere, Postgres and Python, so that's going to do that for me. Uh, and then um, this is going to create a virtual env for me. So you just give it the path to where the virtual env is going to live. I don't want system site packages. Run it as this user. And then we're using actually the requirements file that's in the git repo. Um, install all those. Before we do that, we're going to make sure that we've got our cloned git repo, that we've got our pip dependencies, and that virtual env wrapper is installed. Um, and then to get the second one, again, it's just a pip install. We tell it um, where that is. Uh, so that's our pip install. The last one I wanted to show you was Postgres. Um, so the first lines here are making sure we've got, you know, install Postgres from the package management, um, make sure that it's running. And then we actually want to install two uh, databases and two Postgres users. So here we're using Jinja templating to do that. So we want a Django project and a code.django project um, database and user. Uh, so we're going to for loop through those, um, make sure that the user is present, uh, run it as Postgres. We want to make sure that the server is there before we do that. Uh, and then we want to actually make sure that the database exists. Um, and another undocumented thing is that you will need UTF-8 if you're building a docs um, set up on your database. Uh, yeah, so you can see it's really simple to, you know, kind of convert kind of instructions into salt states. Um, Really easy. Um, so, so that's remote code execution, and that is um, getting salt state. So, salt can do a lot more than what I've sort of taken you guys through today. Um, come on, Wi-Fi. Um, but that's kind of the bread and butter of what you want to be doing with salt. Uh, and it's really easy. The docs are great. Um, check them out online. There's heaps of built-in state modules. There's heaps of built-in um, salt execution modules. Um, so the other thing I was going to talk about is quickly is salt cloud. So uh, now we've got our deployments automated. Um, what you still need to do, though, is get a server with an operating system installed, and you need to get Salt installed on them. So Salt Cloud is a project that can do those steps for you. So it'll go away, spin up a server in the cloud. It supports EC2, Rackspace, OpenStack, most of them. Um, 
install a minion on, you, on it, um, get the master to authentic, pre-authenticate the new minion, uh, and then it's part of your managed servers. So pip install libcloud and saltcloud, uh, and then once you've written your config, it's a single line to spin up a new server, um, add it to your uh, minion pool. And so my example I ran a couple of days ago, it took two minutes to get a new server with salt installed on it, uh, and it was up and running. Um, yes. So, so again, it's really easy to basically write two files, which again, of course, is YAML. So this one is uh, the first one is just telling it which what config to put in the, on the minion. So we, that's just the one line tell it where the master is. And then this is just the security creds for your EC2 account or whatever cloud provider you're using. So it's just telling it, you know, what what keys to use, the password. Um, I want it in Sydney. Uh, I want it to communicate over private IPs, uh, and it's called AWS. Uh, and so then you just write, depending on the different kind of servers that you want to set up, you tell it that which provider you want to use. So that was in in the other tab there. Uh, AWS config. Uh, AMIs are just the different types of servers you can um, install, so that's uh, Ubuntu LTS. Um, I want a medium instance in this case. The bottom, you can see I'm, I'm using a micro instance, so that's just you know bigger, more powerful servers. Um, apply their security groups, uh, and then uh, line 10, we're actually setting some custom uh, grains, so this is not going to be a dev build, and we're going to build the, the Django project. So. Uh, that's Salt Cloud. Um, it's really useful. The other thing we use is Salty Vagrant. Um, basically, it's doing the same thing, but it's using it, doing it on a virtual machine on your own box using Vagrant. Uh, it's really simple. So Salt Stack is great. Check out their website. Check out their docs. Um, it's a great project. It's all written in Python. Um, uh, so in conclusion, Salt is awesome. I can do much more than what I've shown you. It's kind of just as much as I could fit into 45 minutes. Um, probably the most important thing is to, to start using a configuration management tool. Doesn't really matter which one. Salt's a great one. The other one's probably pretty good too. Uh, and the docs for Salt are really, really good. Um, where I'm working, we are hiring a Django developer at the moment. If you want to work, work with some cool tech, um, drop me a, a a line on email or, or Twitter or come see me at the conference. Um, uh, any questions? We have time for a few questions. I'll bring the mic to you. Got one over there. Um, does Salt have some kind of support for running state high state repeatedly, or would you just set up a cron job on the uh, Salt master? Uh, yeah, so like I said, there's heaps of things that Salt does that I you know, didn't have a chance to cover them. Um, one is um, you can basically, in a YAML file, say run state high state on these servers every five minutes, two hours, whatever you want to do, if, if that's the way you want to do it. Um, there's also like an event system, so that when particular things happen, you can trigger states to occur. But yeah, you don't need to do a cron job. It's built in um, to uh, solve itself. So if this loads up in time. That's what it looks like. Schedule high state, function state high state, run it every hour, run it every 35 minutes, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I noticed a couple of times when you were doing things that require SU on the uh, root on the remote box, you actually SU locally. Um, there's no facility inside Salt for authenticating you in such a way that you can run remotely root commands from a local user without having to SU locally. So I, I missed all of that because of the reverb. Um, I noticed when you had to run commands remotely that required root, you ran sudo locally yes. in order to do that. Yep. 
Um, there's part of me that just screams as every time I see you do that. You, yeah, so you, you can, um, by default, you need to be, you know, sudo to run um, salt, the salt command. Um, there is in the docs here, um, uh, running the salt master is an unprivileged user, so um, there's a couple of steps you can do to do that. Because I wanted to just kind of get a quick and easy example up and running, you know, you don't have to do that, but um, there's instructions there to running not as root. Uh, great talk. Um, so if I want to upgrade, let's say, about five hosts, and I want it to behave in such a way that if any one of those fails, I want to revert the entire upgrade, it, is, is that possible? How difficult is that to do? Um, you do get a, so I didn't actually run a state high state there, so you, that will actually fail and tell you how it failed, um, or it'll tell you what it did and how it, how it succeeded and what changes that it made, so, um, and it's coloured output, so the things that worked kind of come out in green and blue, and then if something failed, you're going to get a big red chunk of um, output saying this didn't work for this reason, so um, it's not going to just kind of silently fail on you. On Puppet, I'm vaguely aware, but haven't used, some kind of idea of um, proxying where the Puppet master can do some configuration for something that's not running Puppet. And in my case, I'm thinking it can maybe configure some Ethernet switches using Puppet. I've never used it, but I wonder if there's any facility within SaltStack, because I would love to be able to configure my Ethernet switches via a man manifest. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, again, like I was saying before, there's stacks of things Salt do that I haven't covered and that I haven't actually even properly researched. Uh, I don't know of anything like that, but um, it's worth kind of checking out the docs to see if there is anything, but I'm not aware of it. Um, I just wanted to actually say, yeah, there actually is a way to do that. You've got the ability to write your own modules and state handlers, and you could configure one to take the design that you want to put it in there and have it fire those off. Uh, I have a question. Um, so, like, for me, we don't use configuration management, but we use Fabric to do our deploys. Um, and I was interested in the kind of moving from something like Fabric, which is just Python file, you know, Python functions, to something like Salt. You were talking about how, like, the returners and uh, the, the things you can do can just be Python files would just kind of, you know, hacking in um, <laughs> uh, Fabric functions in terms of not necessarily the SSHing, but the, the actual logic in the Python functions into a salt configuration as a kind of medium step be something that you could do? Yeah, so um, you can see there's basically no Python code in that talk at all. Um, and actually, I'm using some fairly, you know, not too complex examples in production for what we do. Um, so I actually haven't written any Python um, salt modules, all I've done is write YAML and, and Jinja, uh, and it's been that easy. So I would imagine it would be really simple to kind of just have a split window with a fabric on the left and a YAML on the right and, and write a couple of um, uh, state, state files that do, the, do what it was doing. And the great thing with that is that you can kind of, I'm actually running like six different Django websites almost all off the same state tree. It's just with the pillars, I'm just kind of switching out the different, get it from this git repo instead of this git repo, deploy it to this domain instead of that domain. Um, but yeah, you would basically kind of try and convert the fabric that you have to some YAML. Okay, do we, I think we're almost out of questions uh, and time. So uh, thank you very much, Lex. Here is some Norwegian blue coffee and thank a you. special PyCon mug Cheers. for you to enjoy that in. Okay. And uh, please, everyone, thank Lex. Thank you.